Kia ora Koto. I'm Leon Salter, Research Fellow at Massey's Care. Welcome to our panel on organising gig workers in Aotearoa, successes, challenges and strategies for the future. We have three awesome panellists for you today, but and I'll introduce those guys in a moment, but I just wanted to quickly first outline what gig work is in case there's anyone in the audience that doesn't know exactly what it is and why it's important for the labour movement. So the term gig work relative, uh, references a relatively new form of labour facilitated by online platforms. The most famous of these, of course, is Uber with its drive share and taxi services. But that model that Uber established has since been applied to lots of different sectors, including elderly and disabled care workers, cleaners, tradies, creative industries, and you could argue academia. Um, the key unifying characteristics that gig work that characterize gig work is that it's piecemeal. The worker is kind of paid for a kind of micro job and it can last as little as a minute with no pay for time in between. It's precarious. There's no guarantee of ongoing work or any protections offered such as annual leave or sick pay. And gig economy platforms take advantage of grey areas in employment legislation to position themselves as intermediaries intermediary intermediary intermediaries or facilitators of the work rather than employers right in this way they avoid any responsibilities towards the workers who are positioned as partners and individual micro businesses responsible for negotiating all the risk and expense well in some ways gig work threatens to take us kind of back repealing a century of hard fought employment law reforms what makes it so dangerous for the labour movement is it's dressed up in this cool kind of futuristic neoliberal ideology of Silicon Valley. Precarity and, and vulnerability are sold as flexibility, autonomy and choice, coupled with the freedom to be your own boss. You can be a gig worker merely by having a smartphone in your pocket and a willingness to not know where and where you'll be employed from day to day. The gig economy's expansion in the post-pandemic economy therefore poses unique challenges to collective organizing. Gig workers do not generally gather in physical workplaces, but work from home or on private transport. Rather than seeing each other as colleagues with shared interests and demands, they often see each other as competitors who may beat them to the next job. And because of the harsh competitive conditions, volatility and low levels of skill training, Gig workers don't tend to see their work as a profession worth fighting for better paying conditions. However, as well as the challenges, there have been great successes in pushing back against the platforms, both in here in Aotearoa and overseas. And to talk about those, we have three export panelists who've been involved in those successes and struggles to organize gig workers over the past few years. We have Anita Rosen Trater, who is Strategic Project Coordinator for Transport Logistics and Manufacturing at First Union. Hi, Anita. And she leads the campaign Real Work, Real Jobs, which aims to turn insecure work into secure work. Um, do you want to add anything to that introduction, Anita? Uh, kia ora koutou. Thanks, Leon. Um, just that First Union is a large private sector union, for those of you who don't know. We represent 30,000 workers around New Zealand and amongst them are a lot of drivers. So that's kind of where the connection is with Uber drivers. Um, and we've been advocating for and campaigning on um, issues related to rideshare drivers for the last couple of years. Fabulous. And we have Sam Jones, Director of Health on the FTU Senior Leadership Team. We represent about 16,000 healthcare workers in public hospitals in the community. Kia ora, Sam. Do you want to add anything to that introduction? Uh, no, I think that's fine. Fabulous. And we have a third and final panellist is Julian Ang, former Uber driver <laughs> and member of New Zealand Rideshare Drivers Network. And Julian continues to advocate for the rights of Uber drivers just in his spare time. Um, so quickly, as a moderator, I'll be asking some questions to the panelists and we'll kind of progress it in a kind of semi-structured conversational way. 
but those of you watching on Facebook will also have the opportunity to ask questions and make comments to the panelists. I'll be looking for, out for those and hopefully they'll also be appearing on screen and I'll read them out to our panelists if, uh, as we go. Okay, Julian, do you want to just start off because you're the um, only person on the panel that's actually been a gig worker. Do you want to just start off by talking a bit about your experiences as an Uber driver, when you did it, what attracted you to the work and why you thought it was necessary to organize and advocate for better rights and conditions for gig workers? Yeah, Kiara Koto, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm uh, really excited to be here. Thanks for the invite. Um, what, what prompted me to be an Uber driver was basically uh, I, I chose to leave my last uh, salary job for various reasons and wanted to try my hand at self-employment. And I just sort of thought, well, before I sort of launch into that, how am I supposed to support myself? And this whole gig economy thing, especially Uber drivers, that was... I just was scanning, scanning through the job ads and saw this, this opportunity out there that said, like, you could earn $35 an hour, not up to $35 an hour, but $35 an hour. And so I thought, oh, great. Um, just had to find out what, what was actually required to actually become uh, a gig economy worker in terms of ride sharing. Uh, there were lots of things that they sort of held out in terms of flexibility, being your own boss, choosing your own hours. Um, and that was very attractive for somebody that was starting up with their own business because you just don't really, don't really know, um, or it sort of gave me the flexibility to be able to do my own planning on what I need to do any given day to get things moving. And if I need a, like a little bit of a top up in terms of income, I can just hit the road and drive. The, the other thing that was quite attractive was, uh, apart from having control over my time, was being my own boss or the perception of being my own boss. And also the, um, the, the idea that I could make $35 an hour uh, was quite attractive. Um, and that's how I sort of fell into it. And it, was, it, wasn't, it didn't take me, I mean, the first few months were pretty good because at that point in time in Wellington, uh, there weren't that many drivers on board. And that $35 an hour, this is like before tax, before expenses, uh, that figure was one that I, that I could hit on a fairly regular basis when I started driving. Uh, but over the series of months, when they started to recruit more and more and more drivers, because a lot of it was to make sure that uh, they maintained their first mover advantage, that they actually... Uh, have enough drivers out there so that you know riders don't have to wait long um, the the income stream started deteriorating um, and it became quite frustrating for for me um, in terms of trying to uh, earn enough uh, to put food on the table to pay my rent etc etc and this I, I've actually found a Facebook uh, group page and there were a number of um, drivers over there that would just, you know, share information about their experiences. And um, it was quite good to sort of, because you sort of operate as silos, to then have a forum whereby people can actually have conversations, have discussions, um, share their experiences and support each other in, in various ways. Um, and through that Facebook page, we got to know other drivers who were quite unhappy about the deterioration in terms of the pay, uh, the unresponsiveness in terms of Uber, whenever there were issues, it's going to be raised. And yeah, and then we started organizing. Um, we started having more frequent chats. Uh, the original person, so a, a network was, was formed called the Right Sharing Drivers Network, and that was formed in 2017 or 18 and a lot of it was in response to uber uh, dropping the fares or increasing their commission and the original organizer that organized a, a get together a, a physical get together of drivers in the Auckland domain and he also managed to uh, raise a bit of awareness in terms of Getting it, getting the messages across the social media, but also to mainstream media, 
So he had like a little speaking spot on Catherine Ryan's 9 to noon to sort of talk about the lack of pay, the lack of job security, uh, the, tier, the deteriorating conditions, um, and how much Uber exerts over drivers in terms of control. Um, so from there, that, that group formed, and my role in that was basically to be the scribe or the writer. Um, so we all had like various roles. We had a, a person over there that was like an accountant as well, who was doing ride share part time, who had quite a good understanding of what drivers' incomes were, because I could only sort of like talk about it from my own anecdotal experience. But he actually had concrete records that should show that. And um, we had our spokesperson that you know did the interview with Nine to Noon and Radio New Zealand. And I was like doing the government relations side, so writing papers, writing articles, um, and trying to um, get heard through um, lobby by lobbying government, by lobbying government officials, and having meetings with them. Yeah. Great. And did you also organize a one day stop work? Uh, that was that was the original organizer. Um, um, so he he was the one that got interviewed on Ninety Noon. So he he organized that one day stop work thing in the Auckland domain, um, and I was just there to sort of I mean I wasn't physically there because I'm based in Wellington, but we were just there to, to support him and like spread the word around through social media, going like Hey, this thing is happening. It's really good if you can stand up and be counted. Um, there's going to be some media coverage. Uh, we just need to uh, raise awareness that this is a real thing. It's impacting on people's lives. Um, yeah, just 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 to try and get a message out there. Did you get some quite a bit of buy-in on that one day stop work? Or... Um, I think there were a couple of articles written on New Zealand Herald and stuff. And as I said before, there's an um, interview with Captain Ryan, and and that was great. Um, but but I I think you know with the twenty four seven news cycle, it sort of came and went quite quickly. And I think for me, what I find quite difficult sometimes is that when you think that you sort of, when you're sort of building momentum and then you are suddenly, you are given this platform, to sort of um, share your stories and, and, and get, get, your, get your key messages across. The, the, the trick after that then is what do you do with this momentum? How do you keep this momentum going? And it's, it's really difficult when it's just such a loose coalition of drivers. We know we didn't incorporate ourselves as a corporate society or anything, or, or it's a kind of charitable trust. Or, um, and, and, and to also have that um, structure and also look, just putting a bit of rigor in in terms of like having follow-up meetings, having, you know, just to keep the thing, keep the momentum going, to keep the issues live and in, in those, um, and, and sort of centering in people's minds. Um, yeah, so that was really challenging in terms of getting the momentum going. Right, thanks, Julian. Anissa, do you want to talk a bit about how you got involved with Uber drivers um, and gig workers? Yeah, that's a good segue because um, we reached out to Julian and a couple of other drivers he was working with pretty early in the piece. Um, so we we have um, a campaign called Real Work, Real Jobs. And originally we started this campaign because we were organising labour hire workers. Um, labour hire workers are employees, but they're employees in what we'd refer to as a triangular employment relationship. So they're employed by an agency and then they're sent to work um, for a host company. And that might be like a manufacturer, for example, um, and then they're excluded from the union on site, not, not because we want to, um, and they're excluded from the collective agreement. And then that means that they're a lot um, easier for the, the employer to sort of take advantage of. Um, and there was an in incre increasing amount of um, agency workers being engaged in these unionised sites that we had. So um, we started organising those workers to try and ensure that those um, the unions on those sites weren't being undermined um, by employers engaging those workers and also so that those workers had a union so that they had the, the advocacy um, 
you know, to back them up when they needed it. And um, a few years ago, we sort of recognised that, um, you know, labour hire is one form of um, precarious work that's on the rise in New Zealand, but there's actually a number of other forms of precarious work that are, that are becoming more and more problematic um, as they increase, and gig work is, is one of them. Um, and the workers engaged in gig work tend to be classified as contractors, um, and contractors is kind of like a, a whole other category of um, insecure work that, again, can create real issues for workers. And so a couple of years ago, we decided that we would expand the Real Work, Real Jobs campaign to capture not just labour hire workers, but gig workers and other types of contractors um, who are in a kind of dependent contracting relationship or are more vulnerable than your average contractor or than a genuine, genuine contractor, I suppose. So we reached out to Julian and a couple of his mates um, a few years ago because they had sent us... Um, recognizing that we were the driver's union. They had sent us the survey um, that they had done, the results from the survey and this report that they'd written on the results. And we were just utterly blown away by the um, the quality of this work that had been done. You know, it was like professional research level um, of surveying and they had, um, you know, had a high level of engagement and the findings were really illuminating. And at that point in time, there was really nothing out there about, who gig workers were in New Zealand and what their experiences were. I mean, we we knew that that Uber had arrived, you know, they came in 2014 um, and that they had thousands of drivers, um, but there was just no real information about those people. So that was um, really, really incredible work that they did at that time. And um, we sort of like, I guess, picked up um, from where they left off and have been doing some of our own research into gig work since then, as well as um, exploring a whole bunch of other avenues to try and further the interests of gig workers. We're doing things politically, we're doing things um, legally, and we're doing things in the media as well. And of course, we're always engaging with workers who are doing this work, because that's the key part of it. You're so going back to that point, Anita, are gig workers actually allowed to join unions as contractors? So the laws in our country that um, provide for a framework for unions um, and um, are in the Employment Relations Act um, and the hints in the name, it's, it's for employees and it's not for contractors. And in fact, if contractors try and unionize and then try and collectively bargain by sort of setting their wages in a coordinated fashion, they actually run the risk of being accused of cartelling. So um, there's a significant legal barrier there for workers who are classified as contractors. Um, and that's one of the incentives for employers in New Zealand to actually misclassify workers who should be employees as contractors to try and shut them out of these um, provisions in the law. And because there's a total lack of enforcement in our country around this kind of thing, it has just been, it has totally run away from us over the last 30 years. And we have a real big problem on our hands now. So the way that um, First Union has been trying to sort of get around this, um, you know, over the years and other unions as well is, um, we can build what we sort of talk about as networks of workers. So it might not be an official union and you might not be able to launch into collective bargaining on their behalf. But what you can do is you can build a base of people who, um, you know, you can work with them to try and tap into their collective power. And there are some things that they can do, um, you know, outside of collective bargaining um, that will kind of, I guess, um, help them work towards building a real union. And then the ultimate goal is to try and have those workers reclassified as employees or to sort of build a union another way so that they can get the full benefits of unionisation. Right. Yeah, that was that was a point I wanted to get onto a little bit later, sort of what kind of strategies we can use to uh, build collective power in this space. Well, there's one example. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, 
Sam, it, it, you're in the healthcare space. Do you want to talk a little bit about your background of and how maybe gig economy platforms are encroaching into the space and other forms of kind of precarious work that encroach into the space? Yeah, well, so what what we've seen happen and had to be involved in a little bit uh, platform operators um, trying to win contracts to deliver care, you know, home care in people's homes. So these are workers that travel around your communities from home to home for elderly people and support them with personal cares, um, a little bit of wound care, household management, so, you know, cleaning, cooking, um, laundry and what have you, they'll do showering and, and other work like that. Um, and so we started to see uh, these organisations pop up that operate a little bit like um, Uber, although I, I quite like referring to it as Tinder carers, um, where the clients, where, where a person can go online and sort of shop by hour or by job they want done and flick through the photos and, you know, select or not select people as they see fit. Um, our union's been involved setting some quite good standards for care and support workers in this country through a historic equal pay case with Christine Bartlett, setting um, effectively a much higher qualification-based minimum wage for care and support workers. And we also were involved with another union taking a case looking at travel time between clients' as work and doing a quite significant settlement with the government and the employer, the traditional employer providers and networks um, to resolve that and make sure these workers get paid. And then as you touched on in the opening, what you see is this piecemeal hour by hour, client by client shopping for um, work or you know for labor. And you no, know, you start to erode all those conditions. You don't see the same wages, you don't see the travel time being recognised as work and paid because the person's a contractor on individual engagements and then also, you know, no holiday pay, no sick leave and, and in a really scary um, sense, no standards set in terms of training qualifications and ensuring that the delivery of care is of the right standard and safe for the consumers. Great. So, the, yeah, there's a real erosion of sort of skills and yeah and, and rights and that kind of thing that comes with this kind of work yeah absolutely i mean the, the care and support settlement for example is is qualification based um you have you know there's encouragement there's an, a requirement on employers in the law to get people through so we have a highly trained highly skilled care care workforce we have an aging population um and the problem with these other type types of models is there's no structure behind it to deliver that level of training. You would literally be relying on a worker deciding to go off and do all of a training of their own accord, mm -hmm. I guess, so that their their profile on the app looks better and in the hope that one of those clients is actually looking for a qualified worker to come and deliver the work with them. Yeah. Julian, do you want to talk about that with Uber driving a bit, like the lack of training and support that's offered by uber that you have to get basically train yourself and there's terrible well, support um, when i first joined um there was the barriers of entry weren't as low as i think probably six six to eight months after i've joined like um when i became a driver there were requirements to actually get qualifications to become a driver to become a commercial driver there were these tests that you have to set in terms of theory to understand like legislative um, oh, sorry, I say um, regulations, land transport regulations, um, tests that you have to sit or, um, and, and workshops as well with, you know, managing your time because all this, all this health, health and safety requirements in terms of how many hours you can drive and when you need to take the breaks. Um, and also, m more importantly, uh, practical tests, you know, to make sure that you are capable of, you know, maneuvering the vehicle around in a safe uh, in a safe way so all that was sort of removed um so the barriers of entry were, were sort of lowered i can't remember the exact time but it would have probably been uh maybe on the third third quarter ish of 2018 or so um and that opened the floodgates for many people to come on board as drivers because back then 
uh, the only criteria was you, you no longer had to sit any of these tests. All you need is a current driver's license, a full, a full current driver's license, and to have a vehicle that's no less than 10 years old. And um, so you just turn up, sign up, and then within one, two hours, you know, they activate you. Um, so uh, that was that was the, the issue in terms of barriers of entry being lowered. And that meant that the market could just be flooded with drivers. No, sorry, uh, what was the other question again that you asked me? Um, uh, no, yeah, no, that's all good, yeah. Mm. So Uber's kind of motivation is to basically, as you say, flood the market with drivers to because yeah. then because then they that they have a competitive competitive advantage over their competitors right because their customers will be happy because they they never have to wait very long um, yeah so, so the there. model is based on um, minimum driver utilization so that riders actually have minimum wait times so what that actually means in practice that you have a whole bunch of drivers sitting around for ages waiting for a rider to hail them so it's, it's, it's good if you are the consumer because you press the button it's like, oh, here's a driver within a few seconds. But for the driver, you know, you got to sit around and wait, especially when there's no big events on. Um, yeah, so that that uh, maximizing efficiency for the rider is actually directly, um, di or directly um, in proportional to what drivers want to make in terms of income. Because the longer you sit around waiting and you don't get paid for sitting around waiting, you only get paid when the ride actually occurs. Somebody gets into your car, um, you activate the thing, and then you get paid. Um, yeah, it's like inversely proportional. Um, so short wait times for riders is inversely proportional to drivers' incomes. Um, yeah, which is which is not great for the driver. And of course, there's health and safety implications, isn't there? You know, of a de-skilling um when drivers are de-skilled sam do you want to talk about that a bit in in the healthcare space about the sort of de-skilling yeah. and the health and safety implication well I, I actually um think it's quite horrific the potential in the healthcare space i mean it, it's bad enough now when you're delivering care in a one-to-one -one uncontrolled environment and you're heading off to someone's um house and at the moment there's some controls you can reach out to an employer for a bit of support you can you know refuse to work and refuse to do unsafe work as an employee under the health and safety and employment act um and so what you see with this deregulated model or further deregulated is you could you, for both sides in the equation so when it comes to lifting hoists um you know the sort of work or work environment that's got regulated there's none of that there's no one who takes responsibility as a pcbu um you know people who, who are responsible for the health and safety in the workplace they have to invest in it um and so you could be walking into any environment and you have no control over who's in that environment so you could walk in and there's a party going on or a whole bunch of visitors there that you weren't expecting in times like covid you know no screening no way to know that you haven't got someone who's just wandered out of miq or is a close contact and we and we are seeing people cared for in the community now with COVID, not just the hospitals or your quarantine facilities. And so that's going to become commonplace. And so in this environment, there's no one who would we would call the employer or the um, person controlling the platform that is going to take any responsibility for that and make sure that you're not walking in and you have the correct PPE. On the flip side of that, you might have a, a disabled person or a vulnerable elderly person who has an untrained worker coming into their house, there generally is police checks, but beyond that, there's no real accountability. And so you're in a situation where you can end up seeing, you know, theft, um, assaults and also at all sorts of levels and other types of um, taking advantage of the clients in, in these environments. So, so you know, for both sides of a coin here, I, I think that it's a really, really dangerous path to go down. We, we haven't seen it on wide scale in New Zealand yet. Um, and thankfully we haven't seen, you know, government contracts, DHB contracts awarded to those types of providers. Um, but they do have a footing in the private space where people shop for their own care and they're, and they're forever trying to get a foot in the door with the public money. 
Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about that? About like you, you were saying, like um, my care was trying to move in on that DHB contracts, weren't they? On getting that public funding, but you played a role in kind of preventing that happening. Is that right? Well, we 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 engaged with them in a genuine way, um, and they reached out actually to their credit. They're the most established. Um, and so we engaged with them to, to talk about these issues, our concerns. I mean, you, it's the first thing is, you know, these are employees and you want to make sure they're employees and they don't tick that box for us. And the minute you start stepping outside the Employment Relations Act, you've, you've lost a heck of a lot in terms of work rights. Um, and there's no question that what's being delivered in the case of Uber or the Uber Care is, is, um, is work. And so they should be afforded those protections. The next was the standard in terms of the wages and conditions that we had won through a hard-fought battle in the courts. Um, and, uh, you know, an amazing woman in Christine Bartlett stepping up and taking on the case to say that, that um, you know, they weren't being paid women's equal pay in this type of work. And that established quite decent rates. I think as of today, as a um, level three qualified Level four qualified care and support worker, you'd be on twenty seven fifty an hour. Um, when we first engaged with these companies and looked at their websites, it would be questionable whether they were paying the minimum wage. Um, they were willing to address that, but without winning those contracts, they weren't going to be applying the standard and regulation um, to pay the care and support rates, which is effectively a legal minimum for that work in this country. Um, and then when you go the next step into health and safety training. It just isn't there. And so it became impossible for us having, you know, fought so hard and women in this country doing care work, you know, fought for 30 years to get these issues partially addressed and start to move in the right direction to see these sorts of organisations come up and this model of employment or, or not employment um, completely, you know, have the capability of eroding that overnight. And so we just simply couldn't support um, the the government contracts going those ways and with procurement these days and with this government with all of their sort of procurement around the state service and and its ed edges they've got some standards that have to be met and some criteria and we certainly wouldn't sign off on you know a tender care a model to deliver that work that's great so that's a kind of a little win anyway yeah absolutely i mean it just it's a slippery slope right mm. Yeah. Um, Anita, you mentioned the um, RD, Rideshare Drivers Network survey, but you got um, first of also had a, done a survey recently of gig workers, um, haven't you, that came out with a report a few months ago. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, about the results? Yeah, we did some research um, at the end of last year and then produced a report earlier um, on an, uh, this year. And um, Basically, I think that, um, you know, what we found was confirmation of a lot of the um, fears that we had based on having conversations with gig workers around their experiences. Um, but that was really valuable to have because um, when it's just anecdotal, it's really hard to push back against what is like, you know, sy systemic problems or structural problems, basically. Um, and it's really difficult to go to, you know, the media or to go to the government, for example, um, if you're just talking about, you know, um, a story here and there, you really need some kind of solid evidence. So we did the survey and we found that more than 50% of gig workers in New Zealand are actually earning less than the minimum wage. And when you say that to people, they're really shocked because they think that people generally believe that everyone's entitled to the minimum wage they don't understand that contractors are not covered by that legislation. Um, and that means that they can dip, dip very far below the minimum wage. And there's been some further research recently around courier drivers, and um, they found that some of, you know, some of some Aramex courier drivers are earning like $7 an hour. You know, it's really, really shocking. Um, and that's, of course, when you... Um, when you take into account the expenses that they have to run their their business which fall onto them as opposed to the company whereas if you're an employee then those expenses are generally covered by the business that employs you 
Uh, we also found, um, which we were a little bit surprised by, but maybe we shouldn't have been, um, was that about 60% of gig workers have a tertiary qualification. So it kind of lends a bit of truth to that story. You hear um, people tell about, you know, uh, you know, my taxi driver tonight was a microbiologist or my taxi driver was, you know, this high powered lawyer back in their home country or whatever it might be. These people are not um, doing these jobs because they don't have the smarts or aren't capable of doing other jobs. There's a whole range of factors why people end up in this kind of work. Um, but the key point is that, you know, they're not being, this is not a meritocracy, you know, they're not being paid according to their skills and competency. Um, this is really over exerting its power over workers and it doesn't matter how smart they are, how skilled they are, they can't push back against the framework um, that Uber has put in place um, and that persists, you know, um, regardless of what they try and do. And uh, one of the other interesting points we found through the survey is that it's about a 50-50 split between people who do gig work um, on top of other work. So they might have another job that they do during the day or, um, you know, certain times of the week, and then they might fit their work for Uber or other gig work around that work. Um, and then uh, and then the other group of people is um, workers who do this full time. So they're, they're trying to make a living by driving for Uber um, or driving for, um, you know, a number of rideshare companies at the same time. And that's a real struggle for them. But the interesting thing about it is that because of that split, that almost 50-50 split in the workforce, you also have um, a bit of a, a bit of tension there around what people really want out of this work. Because the people who are doing it on top of another source of income they value the flexibility, even though the flexibility is a little bit of a myth. Um, they value that more than anything else. Um, and they will make many, many sacrifices in order to maintain that flexibility because they see that if it wasn't there, they just wouldn't be able to do this job. They wouldn't have the supplementary income that they so desperately rely on because they're probably working a full-time job somewhere else on minimum wage. And it's impossible to live on that in Auckland City and in Wellington City and in many other parts of New Zealand. Um, there's a tension between those people and the people who actually are trying to make a living off these apps. They're doing it full time. And what they really want is some kind of security because at the end of the day, our rent is not flexible. Our bills are not flexible. We rely on a stable income to survive in society as it is at the moment. So they really need some kind of job security. So that's one of the key challenges for us as I see it, this kind of um, split in terms of, of what these workers really want out of this work. Yeah, what what do you think, like me and Julian were talking about a, li a little bit like this, like, about this last night. Like, So what do you think is your kind of end goal for gig workers? Like, do you want to see them all as employees or do you think because of that split that they need to be some kind of like, they need to have some option? Like one thing I thought maybe that after they've worked for a platform for six months, they could have the option of becoming employees or do you think that could work? Well, I mean, if I'm just thinking about rideshare drivers specifically, if you look at the, the true nature of the work they're doing and the relationship between them and the platform, our view is that they are employees. So the law doesn't really care like what label has been tacked on them or what the contract says, or even if they have a contract, the law cares about the true nature of the relationship and the nature of the work. And when we look at it, what we see is employment um, under the guise of contracting. Um, and we're taking a case to the employment court right now, um, First Union and ETO together are taking that case. And um, what we're hoping for out of that is that the employment court will rightly declare that these that the workers of Uber are actually employees of Uber. The thing about the flexibility, I suppose, is that there is actually provision for flexibility for employees under um, New Zealand law. So a lot of workers do actually have 
a fair bit of flexibility. Um, it just has to be negotiated. And there is, I will admit that there's a problem around employers um, being, um, you know, I guess dictating to employees or to workers um, when they should work and for how long and for how hard and basically everything that they can get away with. And the answer to that, in my view, is that those workers need to be unionized and they need to push back collectively mm. because individually it doesn't work, right? So if you're in a strong union and you're able to push back, you can assert what you want out of your job and you can assert that level of flexibility that you might need to accommodate your life around your work because, you know, work is not the only thing we have Um you know, we have lives outside of that, and that's really important. Um, but fundamentally, when it comes down to it, you know, all workers should have um, a certain level of, um, you know, they should have a certain level of standards, um, regardless of how they're classified. So it should not be the case that any worker in New Zealand is paid less than the minimum wage. That's absolutely mm -hmm. absurd. And I think we can all agree on that. And it should not be the case that workers don't have access to sick leave um, you know, I had a courier driver on the phone to me yesterday saying that um, he, you know, he got a COVID test, he didn't feel well, he could barely stand up, he couldn't breathe, he was forced back to work because he didn't have sick leave. And on top of that, his employer was going to charge him a thousand dollars a day to cover the work in his absence because oh my God. workers who are classified as contractors, you know, these are the kinds of things that are happening, and I just don't think the general public. Um, you know, necessarily understands that it's that bad out there. Cool. Julian, did you want to speak a little bit about that? Like, because I know you maybe thought that, because I was just talking a little bit about that recent UK ruling in December last year where they designated Uber drivers as work, as that middle category of workers between contractor and employees. Did you have any thoughts about whether that middle category of worker could work here in New Zealand? Julian, you're on mute. Can you? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, as, Sorry. as I was saying, um, I understand where the, where the unions are coming from, you know, in terms of having another category of going between if you like between employee and truly independent contractor um, because there is a risk that if you have another set subcategory of people uh, that there is almost like a, a carve out from people who would ordinarily be employees to then experience less rights than employees. So so I, I think the unions are they are not comfortable with that position because there's still a risk and loophole for exploitation to occur because this group of people would have some minimum rights, but not all minimum rights that employees would experience. Uh, but I guess it's a little bit tricky when, well, one of the arguments is because a lot of gig economy work is operates in the gray you like. And that's what um, Anita said before with like lots of people who do this part-time, they still want the flexibility. It's quite, it's quite a tricky area to navigate. I mean, for me, like that has worked in the UK in terms of having this um, tree-layered system as opposed to a binary system in New Zealand. And it's worked out well for them in terms of the Supreme Court ruling that, you know, these people should be classed as workers that would have some minimum rights, but not all. Um, if we move into that framework, I think there needs to be a lot more um, sort of like debate or discussions around what that could actually look like in practice. Um, and even if we were to sort of uh, make a transition to that framework that requires legislative change, that's going to take quite a long time, you know. Um, so the, the, the court case that Anita was, was talking about a little bit earlier, we're still operating within the current framework. If, if successful, that would be an ability to sort of short circuit this thing and sort of get those rights applied immediately to a group of workers. And, and that could then mean that if there's precedent set in that area, more and more of these rights 
true court action could be applied for the appeal to other workers in this area. So, so on, on, on the one hand, the UK system potentially can work for us as well. I, I, I just a little bit cautious because I just read this article about, um, you know, the Hobbit law and how there's this thing that's going through parliament, uh, which is to deal with um, ring fencing some rights to still enable certain class of workers working in the film industry to collectively bargain, but not more than that. Um, so, so I, you know, there's just a, there's a really good article in the Policy Quarterly, which I just stumbled upon like 15 minutes before this. I was like trying to scramble to try and digest it, but I'm happy to share it with um, everyone else on, on this. It's just a, it's a public article and it talks about the dangers of, of when, when bad law has really been set in terms of the Hobbit law and that basically denied a whole bunch of people working in the film industry who would, who would ordinarily be classified as employees because there was a tested court case in Bryson versus, um, is it Three Bigfoot or something? I don't know, the, the, the Hobbit production company and, and, and the court ruled in favor of that independent, uh, sorry, that contractor uh, being classed as an employee. And then obviously the key government, because they were wanting um, the, the films to be kept in New Zealand with a lot of lobby, lobbying for Peter Jackson, changed the law to, to take away the rights um, of these so-called employees to be able to collectively bargain, you know, took away, their, took away all their rights to actually have any sort of minimum protections. Um, so that, that piece was very critical on this, this working group that was set up. Uh, that proposed this carve out, but the carve out was very limited in terms of what these uh, contractors slash employees could could uh, could gain in terms of minimum protections. Um, and saying that this, you know, the, the, the recommendation in that paper was more like it was bad law. This repeal the damn thing and then start again, uh, and don't have this going between thing. Where you're having this carve out that allows people to collectively bargain and not much else, and have this subcategory of employees who still don't have a lot of minimum protections um, on the basis of global competition um, uh, for these yeah. forms and big productions to be moved overseas. It seems um, like uh, so having it, sorry to, uh, to having done a little bit of research on what's happening in the UK. Hmm since that ruling since in december that seems to be what's happening there as well with uber drivers now that, that they've they've said they're going to collectively they're going to allow collective bargaining but then they've mm -hmm. kind of uber since have retracted on that and 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 said no it's going to be a negotiation with no formal legal framework for those drivers to actually um bargain uh, and they've mm -hmm. and they've um so yeah as, in a kind of typical uber way <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. there's this that everyone thought oh there's this been supreme court ruling that's it now they're going to have to provide all these kind of rights and privileges for gig but for gig workers and they've and they're kind of trying to with their army of lawyers trying to worm their way out of it um yeah so, so I'm, I'm on the one hand i you know when i look at um comments through like the uber facebook uh this is like 5,000 Uber drivers over there. And, and there's a lot of um, concerns from them about losing their flexibility, being their own boss. Blah, blah, blah. So, you know, there's something that probably should not be dismissed outright. Um, but also, I'm also a little bit cautious with like the third way, the dependent contractor model or the worker model in the UK, whether there is whether that is the best way, just because you know, you are getting a bit more rise, but you're still trading off on some minimum protection. So like it is, you know, collectively, it's just the best outcome for society and for people who are actually doing work for the company who are effectively operating as employees. Um, um, yeah, so I'm sort of like, yeah, sort of not 100% leaning one way or the other. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sam, did you have any thoughts on this? Right. Sorry. You uh, sorry to interrupt, Sam. I just wanted to jump in and just say one thing, which is like, because I have this conversation with people all the time, right? It's like rights or flexibility. And it's kind of this, where does that even come from, right? Like it's this complete like false dichotomy. I mean, why should you have to choose between having 
flexibility and rights. It's completely ridiculous. And we should be reforming the system immediately to ensure that workers can have rights and flexibility um, in their favour, of course. It's, you know, to me, it's just completely ridiculous that we would have to choose between the two. Totally, yeah. Sam, did you want to go? Yeah, well, look, I um, I mean, I, I kind of go at a slightly different angle in terms of identifying that work is work. And regardless of what you want to t label the person performing that work, it should have standards and conditions. Um, people need job security and in income security to live and we we just need to keep pushing back on separation based on you know deciding that you're an independent contractor or in between that model or an employee and and our employment legislation needs to be wide enough that it captures work and that way these companies and you know you talked about lawyers and they'll do that they'll tie things up in legal processes they'll you know, they'll try and influence government the same as we will. Um, and you, ideally what you need is to get around their ability to to do all of that or to get lawyers to look at a different model or a loophole and just make sure that work is performed safely and in a way that respects people and, and has some humanity to it. Um, Anita touched on it. People in this country alone and in other countries would be horrified by the idea that you're not getting the minimum wage, that you're not getting a wage where you can put food on the table, have a secure roof over your head, be warm in the winter, you know. So And so it comes back to being that simple, really. Um, and that's why that case is arguing their employees, because we have to operate under the framework we have. Um, but more and more, the way labour and work is organised and arranged um, is going to it's going to morph, is going to be remote, and we see it in traditional employment, the sort of apps to manage and engage people coming into that space, even when they are calling it employees, um, and there needs to be a way to make sure that those workers not only have minimum standards, but have meaningful access to unions and to organise themselves. Um, so that they have a collective voice and address that inequality, that power imbalance that exists in a, in a relationship, an employment relationship. Yeah, how would you kind of enforce that? Do you think a, a kind of there needs to be a bill of rights for contractors and gig, work, gig workers and some kind of independent body oh. to enforce that? No, I, I honestly think that the Employment Relations Act needs to be modernised so that it covers work. Right, yeah. It covers, yeah, contractors, yeah. Or just work generally. Because they'll come up with something else, right? You know, self-employed, independent contractor, you name it. You, they'll, mm. they'll look for ways around it. And so at the core of it, work's being done. Work's being performed by someone. It should be respected right. and valued. Yeah, any task that's done for repayment, right? It should be. Yeah. Come under. And, and health and safety should sit right in the centre of that, not just wages. Like, like terms and conditions of employment go well beyond wages, um, and you can't restrict it to that. The, the one of the legal areas that this might start to be possible if if they do it the right way. Um, this government's looking at fair pay agreements, and they would be a little bit like the awards from back before the nineties. Probably not as strong as awards would be, but. But still, the concept is that a fair pay agreement covers an occupation or an industry or sector, and we're arguing that it should cover everyone in that occupation or um, sector, not not matter whether, you know, if, if you pick on cleaning, which might be one of them, it shouldn't matter whether you're deemed to be an independent contractor, an employee, um, or even run a small cleaning business, actually the standard should be set and there needs to be some way to make sure that e the economic employer, which is the people paying for the work, are having to meet that. And that means avoiding the contracting that Anita touches on with courier drivers where, where you break it all down, someone's on $7 an hour. Um, you can't have those people being able to win contracts that, that are that low 
And so, you know, things like fair pay agreements, broadening of the Employment Relations Act, um, as long as they get this stuff right, you start to set minimum standards. But but you can't, you know, minimum standards really isn't enough. I'm sure Julian will tell you, you know, $35 an hour is $15 an hour above the current adult minimum wage. Um, and you take out all the costs, it's a lot less than that in your take home. But workers actually need meaningful access to unions and the ability to organise themselves so that they can win fair paying conditions. Yeah, I, th I think uh, one of the things that um, that probably needs to be conveyed, and I'm not entirely sure how this can be done, is to impress upon the people who, like when I interact with Uber drivers on like the Facebook page and all that, um, it's quite a strong, and I'm just not sure whether this is a representative sample of all of them. It, it, you know, it could just be like, you know, the people who, who speak up the most and talk about it the most um, could just be in a minority. But there's this sentiment of anti-unionism. So um, it's almost like trying to sell unions as being, hey, we're, we're actually the good guys and we're here to support you. We're here to actually make your lives better, make your conditions better, make your pay better. And and I mean, it's 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 a... It's a systemic thing, you no. Know, since all those reforms, you know, the back back in the heyday, um, in, in the eighties and all that, um, union bashing or, or a version of that has become quite common in like a lot of people's daily lexicon in terms of language. So, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's not uncommon for me sometimes to hear uh, sometimes when there's a proposal for strike, whatever it is, for, for some people that I know to go like, oh, all this, you know, unions is here to make trouble, blah, 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 blah. So the, there's an image perception thing that there is a barrier. I, I sort of feel that it's sort of, that would allow or encourage people who are, either they see themselves as independent contractors or something to, to go to unions going like, this is actually a safe thing for me to do. And, um, and they're here to support me and they are not, you know, they're not some kind of supporting and some supportive or some sort of totalitarian regime, <laughs> and, you know, mm. that, that, that sort of thing. And, and I, I think that's just quite important in terms of building, building that bridge. Yeah. There's that kind of pervasive neoliberal ideology, isn't there after over the last kind of 30, 40 years that has really mm -hmm. kind of painted. Yeah. unions as kind of yeah as barriers to freedom as yeah as as barriers to kind of entrepreneurialism and that kind of thing should we go back to the the point you made and and gina's made it in the comments on facebook that she's that people really don't know about this kind of thing what and likewise what anita said about um yeah yeah it hurts her to hear that anita what what you were saying anita about you know that that career driver that's on seven dollars an hour and face and and feeling unwell in times of covid and is feeling the pressure of of, of like having to pay a thousand dollars if they don't work do you think what why aren't these stories coming out in the media why aren't the public hearing about this stuff do you think Anyone? well i think that um the experiences of Courier drivers are probably actually the, the ones that we do hear about the most. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of um, exposure of the reality of being a courier driver in New Zealand over the years, and that's because First Union has been campaigning on behalf of those workers for quite a while now. Um, and so when we have workers come to us with these types of stories, we try and support them to be able to tell them more widely to expose what's really going on. But there are significant barriers to workers telling their stories publicly. Um, if you're a contractor and you have no job security, so you have no right to a fair process before being dismissed from your job, and you also have no right to challenge an unfair dismissal by taking a personal grievance, um, let alone like a notice period or something like that, um, you know, you can be fired on a spot and you have no, no legal recourse. So a lot of workers are petrified to speak publicly about what's going on for them, um, even anonymously at times. And then there's an issue around, you know, the media um, publicizing anonymous stories because, um, you know, it's harder to verify the source. 
uh, or potentially it's not kind of as um, salacious, I suppose, as if you have a name and a face to put to. Um, but, you know, we're hearing about these stories all the time and wherever possible we are supporting workers, workers to tell them more wild, widely, but there are significant barriers to them doing that as well. Yeah, um, Mohan's asked a question, what are the communication challenges for unions in countering this propaganda? Do you think there needs to be a kind of joined up approach for unions to really sort of counter the anti-union discourse? Is that a question for me? Uh, you, you or Sam or... I'll, I'll kick off and then Sam can come mm -hmm. in, but I mean anti-union propaganda has been around as long as unions have been around and um you know the fact of the matter is is that we are speaking truth to power and we're saying things that people don't want to hear powerful people don't want to hear um and those people have access to money and they have access to communication channels and they'll do whatever they can um to try and sow um you know a level of distrust in the general public against unions um i mean we have hundreds of thousands of members in, in New Zealand across the union movement. So clearly those workers think that it's worthwhile to be in a union and we interact with workers on a daily basis who um, see the benefit of being unionised. And I often ask, you know, when I come across workers who are hesitant to join the union, don't really know what it means, they've heard some anti-union propaganda and they haven't really been able to kind of put it in perspective, I often say to them, you know, why is it that your boss so desperately doesn't want you to be in a union? You know, clearly mm -hmm. um, there's a reason for that and it's because it's in your interest to be in a union and not in his interest for you to be in the union. Sam? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the whole thing's a bit of a falsehood because unions are just collective groups of workers. And so it's actually worker bashing, which is pretty perverse. Um, and, you know, Anita touches on the numbers, and so those people, obviously, their kids, you tend to find union members had parents who were union members. We don't do education in schools about this stuff. You don't really teach, you know, and it surprises me, 16, 17-year-olds in high school are workers. They're often workers, and yet they're not being taught about their rights or the Employment Relations Act or the right to organise our employment law in this country um, actually recognises the inherent imbalance of power in the workplace and seeks to promote collectivism amongst workers. So there does need to be more done at a whole bunch of levels and unions will keep doing what they do. Union members are the biggest change factor there because they talk to other workers and workmates. They change jobs and still have good experiences that they talk about. Um, and the stuff that never gets picked up. I mean, I don't know about a media campaign because every year they'll they'll put in the um, you know even in the New Zealand Herald, which is an incredibly right wing paper, um, the stuff that comes out of Victoria University that shows categorically based on evidence that unionised workers with collective bargaining have better terms and conditions, get better pay rises, have more job security, um, and yet you know, no light bulb goes off. So I think one-to-one -one conversations never can be underestimated. Yeah. Should we move on to sort of um, what kind of strategies have worked in this space to improve, uh, uh, to organise gig workers and and, and what, you, what kind of strategies do you think unions should be employing in the future um, as sort of gig work becomes more common and widespread? Anita, do you want to go on that one or? Um, I think that I think the ultimate goal is to build a, a, a powerful base of workers, you know, to build a collective of workers, which is the fundamental thing about building a union. And that doesn't change in this environment at all. We still want that because that's where the power is. If workers decide to do something collectively, um, you know, that's where the power lies and whether there are employees, workers, contractors, some of that stuff kind of falls by the wayside when you've got hundreds of people putting down tools and like gathering in the domain or whatever it might be. Um, but in terms of like the tactics and the methodology and all that sort of thing um, around it, some of those things are a little bit different. You know, there's some challenges to get around when you're dealing with workers who are 
remote um, with with workers who are misclassified, um, with workers who might feel that they're they're vulnerable because they don't have any job security, or maybe maybe they think that the job they're in is a, you know a pathway to residency and they don't want to rock the boat. Um, mm. But yeah, I think um, a multi pronged approach is what we've been aiming for um, to date, and we'll keep keep doing that, but probably with just like a little bit more oomph. Um, and that's, um, and I'm talking about, you know, we're, we're doing stuff politically, we're doing stuff legally, we're doing stuff in the media, and we're, we're working with workers directly. So it's not just about kind of relying on like, one avenue to try and um, achieve our goals. Yeah, so you use social media quite a bit in your communication with gig workers, because obviously, that you can't go into work physical workplaces like you can in other jobs, can you and speak to workers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So with any group of workers we're organising, you know, we do what works for for them. Um, you you can't just take like one model of of organising and just kind of, you know, impose it on any any group of workers. You really have to assess the um, individual circumstances of those workers and of that of the of, of the workplace, um, and then apply something that is going to work. And actually, you know. Um, it forces you to be really creative as an organizer, which I think is really uh, valuable and really rewarding. Um, and I encourage any organizers out there in the movement who, you know, want to get involved in this kind of thing to do it because it is, yeah, it's extremely um, enjoyable work. Gets you out of your comfort zone. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Sam, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Because you were mentioning stuff like... Um cooperatives and and maybe sort of being a bit flexible when it comes to collective bargaining and that kind of thing well i, I think it, in this current environment and we've seen a little bit of it in australia if it's successful where, where you are dealing with a legal framework that's excluding these workers from collective bargaining which is what you know traditionally unions would would is a kind of a pinnacle of workers engagement with the union um, historically, is to look at filling some of the other gaps that are missing for them that you can provide. So with the care industry, where you're seeing this type of work arrangement and no training, no face-to-face -face training, no peer support, um, that big hit gaps in that, unions have been quite successful overseas at setting up that for them and helping facilitate that. It, it, it assists in two major ways. One is obviously it fills a massive gap for the workers um, that they need and, and quite frankly the clients and all of the rest of us need them to have, um, which means that there's some relevance there for the union. There's a connection with those workers and an ability to engage with them. And out of that contact and that relevance, you can then start to have the other conversation with them where you're trying to get them to lift their hopes and expectations a bit, understand the things that Anita touched on, where you, it's not really a trade-off between flexibility and employment security and conditions. Um, those things aren't mutually exclusive. And then try and organise them for power so that they can start to have a real, um, a real say and a voice in terms of those terms and conditions and not be pitted against each other. So, so I think those those are really effective models and especially in an environment where you can't you know just get your traditional access to workers and then organize around collectively bargaining for better conditions directly yeah i think that's a really great point sort of pro providing training and professional development is a really valuable way to make workers like sort of realize that how valuable being in the union is um julian do you want to speak a bit about that as a former gig worker um, I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, even like for me, you know, doing the office work, I back to being a salary person, surprise, surprise. Um, uh, the, the unions do offer things like, you know, <clears throat> professional development. So if that, because one of the things that, one of the key things that I sort of feel in terms of trying to get the workers on board and to believe in the story and the good work that the union's trying to do is to engage them then, you know, the question is, how do you engage them? You know, there's all these different means that Anita has explained before, you know, legal, um, lobbying government, um, social media, and other kind of reach out type campaigns. But if, if somehow the unions can sort of like demonstrate to them that 
we are here to support you. We're here to do these things for you. But on top of that, we are also going to try and give you a leg up in terms of your professional development so they could open more doors for you. Um, I think that would certainly there'll be more and more enduring, I think. And once you don't get that level of engagement um, and they see that, you know, these organizations are actually, you know, for organizing to further our interests as individual, but, but as a collective and as a societal thing as well, um, then, you know, they, I think they'll be more willing in a, in a way to sort of front foot uh, the, these movements a little bit more because ultimately you need the people who are actually suffering or who are bearing the brunt of these systems to be able to go out there front footed to some extent and tell their stories because it's those stories that get, you know, people invested in it. And, you know, so you can bring the public along and then hopefully by bringing the public along, you know, there could be some sort of pressure for ministers or the government to sort of like act on things as well. Um, yeah. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I, I thanks for that comment, Bahale, ba, Bala Mohan. Um, I haven't seen that movie. Sorry, we missed you. Directed by Ken Loach. Has anyone else seen that? Yeah. Quite oh, depressing, but like, quite true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ken Loach films are pretty depressing, but they're very real, aren't they? And a question from Mohan. Um, are we seeing any kind of different innovations on platform cooperatives and worker own platforms in New Zealand that we are seeing overseas? Not really, eh? I mean, there was a little bit, there's Sophie's Angels in Wellington that's operating like a women only um, ride share service for, that was offering safe rides for women when they were coming home from nights out. But apart from that, I'm not really aware of any, are you guys aware of any alternative models? work around um, platforms yeah i'm not i'm not aware of any in in aotearoa at the moment um it would be fantastic to see one i think the the issue there is the technology right um the technology is 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 pretty advanced um at least it seems as such to me as someone who wouldn't know the first thing about trying to develop an app um and then also just competing against these established um you know silicon valley giants like uber um i imagine that that would be quite risky and quite scary for for a group of workers but um like mohan said there are some examples globally of that of that happening um with some some level of success and that's that's really fantastic and i think that i think that they might have been union backed as well um and that's helpful because obviously um that brings in, you know, some resources that those workers might not necessarily have at their disposal otherwise. Mm, yeah, that's one thing I've been getting from the interviews we've been doing with Uber drivers is the kind of market dominance of Uber because it's been here for so long, 20, since 2014, is it? It's got so much familiarity. Everyone's got it on their phones, haven't they? When you think, oh, I, late at night, I need, I need to go. Even the word you'd say, I need get an uber wouldn't you you wouldn't say i'm gonna get a ride share you'd say get an uber yeah. and it's so it's really difficult and the amount of capital that they've got behind them as you said the capital investment is to do the marketing to yeah as you say to to, to create a big a good app it's it's a huge and investment and let's yeah. not forget that you know a lot of their capital comes from the fact that they avoid paying tax all over the world yeah um, yeah oh yeah know. do you want to talk a little bit about your that report that's recently come out yeah yeah so um again first union and and eto this was a joint project we um commissioned um SICTA, which is the um center for international corporate tax accountability and research um, experts in this area to um conduct research into Uber's tax activities or lack thereof in New Zealand 
um, and to kind of build a bit of a picture of the corporate structure of Uber around the world so that we can understand exactly, you know, what is happening with the money that they're generating in New Zealand and around the world. And, um, you know, surprise, surprise, we found that Uber um, avoided paying a, a significant amount of tax. And um, we were looking at um, last year and we estimate that they avoided paying between 6.4 million and 12.8 million dollars in tax um, in New Zealand in that year alone. Um, that's a conservative figure as well, based on um, a, an, a margin that we think is probably lower than what they actually have, given they have very few overheads. They don't even have an office in New Zealand. They don't have a single employee here. Um, and so they're doing that all over the world. The money is literally going from each individual um, end user, so each rider, um, directly to the Netherlands. And then a small amount of that is coming back to pay drivers. So even understanding like exactly how much money they're making is really difficult. There's just zero transparency around it. And that's why you often hear this this story that um, go, that goes around about um, Uber being um, not not turning a profit, like Uber is not a profitable company, um, which is which is a load of crap. You know, they're just very effectively hiding all of their money, um, and you know that's the case for a number of these multinational tech giants. Um, and unfortunately, governments around the world are just absolutely failing to hold them to account on it. Yeah, that's a great point as well. And um, Uber itself is like got really got, uh, as you said, they they've got no, they're not registered as a company in New Zealand, and they've really got no kind of physical base here at all. Have they? They used to have these green light hubs that drivers could go to and speak to actually employed staff by Uber, but they they've closed those. So I don't I don't think they actually sort of employ any staff here in New Zealand, apart from maybe a couple of managers. Uh, and so they're contributing very little to the New Zealand economy. In fact, they're actually contributing to it in negative ways by avoiding paying that tax, aren't they? Yeah, I, th I think it's a symptomatic of a lot of these international conglomerates where they do transfer pricing. So, you know, basically whatever amount of money they make over here in terms of revenue, the head office overseas that's um, parked in a low tax jurisdiction charges those regional offices um say in ip you know intellectual property charges and that could form like 80 percent of their revenue that's generated from that regional office so that they only pay tax on that 20 percent um it's it's unfortunate but you know google does it uber does it a whole bunch of other ones do it um and that's why that's why um i need to say that um unfortunately governments around the world um, I mean, they're trying to, to close the loophole. There, there, are, there are things that are being done, but it's, it's, it's quite late in the piece. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Mohan's comment, platform capital avoids paying tax, the lack of transparency and accountability. Did you get any kind of feedback from government, Anita, from that report on their tax or was it just? Not as yet. Um, we have sent it to the relevant ministers and at some point we would really love to have a discussion with them about it, um, but we haven't heard back as yet. I think they're pretty busy at yeah. the moment. Um, but I think that initial discussions we've had with them indicate that they are aware that this is a problem, you know, it's not, it's not news to them that Uber is avoiding paying tax. It's just about, um, you know, coming up with a way to actually, um, you know, force them to pay tax. There's a similar thing for Google and Facebook, isn't there? And the and the way they're affecting the the newspaper and media industries without paying tax. That's right. That's right. And it, I mean, it makes sense that these companies that are so you know they're experts in this this technology that you know is completely over the rest of our heads. Um, and there's just so much money. It's just an unbelievable amount of money that they have pouring into them um you just can't even fathom it you know and it, it makes sense that they are the most talented companies at evading tax as well um at building these corporate structures for the um you know th the purpose of avo avoiding tax and avoiding responsibilities when it comes to the um you know the workers they engage yeah 
Yeah. Um, Sam, you're at sort of, you have meetings with government, don't you? And, and, that, and that kind of thing. Do you want to add anything? Oh, look, we, we do engage, um, obviously, in healthcare and a lot more than normal at the moment with COVID. Um, it would be fair to say that this stuff doesn't really come into their radar other than, you know, there's one area that's big for this government and it's driven by some good principles but has some real risks for the workers to head down the space and that is they call it enabling good lives and it's the direction that disability support's heading in. And what we've had, you know, the, the journey of dis disability support, mental health and other areas in this country is going from really horrific institutions that we got rid of, which was great, and created a way for people to live a bit more independently in our communities, in their communities, and, in, you know, engage like the rest of us because they're just people. Um, and they're heading, and then that's been all delivered by traditional providers or employers through quite rigid com contracts and those rigid contracts don't provide, you know, we get back to that flexibility thing, a lot of choice and flexibility for the people accessing disability services. So with some quite good initiatives and a lot of voice coming from the disabled community, they're looking at other ways to deliver that. And so the government's strongly heading down an individualised funding path, um, which, you know, gives the, the person with a disability a lot more control over what they purchase with that but what we've seen overseas with that model um, are not actually better outcomes for people with disabilities and most certainly not better outcomes for workers and so we need to learn those lessons here and try and we what we try and engage with government about is not trying to undo or cross over the desires of people with disabilities themselves. I think we support and have some alignment with their goals and aspirations. Um, what we do want to see, though, is an, something to make sure that we don't just erode the the employees' um, rights, conditions, right to organise, etc. And and there's already some, you know, there's a lot of them now. There's these companies that set up that um, just sort of facilitate that for the disabled people and thankfully still in most cases provide employment agreements although i wouldn't say that they're great ones and and that sort of stuff so that they're still employees however more and more the way those people are engaged becomes electronic digital remote um and you know the client becomes the employer and so it starts to morph into this area where the liability moves on to the family and and the disabled person or the other choices, independent contracting, which you just slide straight into the, you know, the Tinder carers model, the Uber carers. And, and so we're engaged with government in that space to try and ensure that the employment legislation and regulation around their methods and, and direction in terms of dividing, uh, providing better outcomes for disabled people are not at the cost of a workforce and that they understand that, that they don't have to be. Um, and we need to find some way to protect that. So there's quite a lot of engagement going on around that. Oh, cool. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Yeah, Bala Mohan's got a comment. Um, is it? I think it's trying to get at, at, at sort of that, that, that can be kind of consumer activism. That could that could be a kind of strategy that we could pursue. Do you, Julian, do you think that kind of like? Um, consumer activism angle could be pursued in it to, to put more pressure on uber some more campaigns about sort of how bad uber is and also there's kind of investor investor activism as well at a, a couple of months ago delivery uh, was it deliveroo there was a kind of there was a campaign when it went on the stock market for people to disinvest from deliveroo and it, it seemed to gain some traction do you think that kind of strategy could work here um, yeah, definitely. Um, but I, I guess the, the thing is to try and impress upon people. I mean, first thing is to get the messages out there as to what workers in these areas actually put up with in terms of, you know, a lot of them are making less than minimum wage after expenses have been um, they have, have been taken into account. Um, but But also, I suppose 
making them care like like why should they care because like this the technology is good the service is good it's efficient um but it's just trying to get the message across as to why they should care about this why should they care about writing is it say for example to their local mp going like you know i'm a member of your electorate i'm i'm, I'm concerned about this this is not acceptable this shouldn't be happening in new zealand um and yeah it's just getting those messages out there but also it, that, that takes time it takes a lot of effort because it, it's it's something that needs to be ongoing um and that's why it sort of brings me back to the points uh, i said a little bit earlier about uh, utilizing perhaps maybe a little bit of the expertise or what maybe unions can provide to help drivers organize and there's mechanisms that anita mentioned about that but then also to have drivers who um, are supported to be able to share their stories, to go out there um, and share their stories and, and and have enough drivers do that uh, for a sustained period of time so that it starts registering in people's consciousness. And, you know, you, you hope then that, you know, that most Kiwis would be like, well, that's I'm not really that comfortable with that. That seems to be quite a bad thing. Um, what can I do? Then I suppose one of the things that, Part of the messaging is well. If you really care about this, you can take step one, step two, step three. Where there's going to be the sharing it with your friends, um, uh, lobbying your your electorate MP. Um, um, yeah, I mean, there's this whole bunch of mechanisms, I suppose. But it's 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 just staying on message and telling compelling enough stories so that people, consumers, if you like um take an interest in it and and if it's widespread enough they might even know other people personally who are working in these areas and you know it then becomes a bit more relatable to them because if you are the end consumer and all you're concerned about is the price of a product or how how efficient it is in terms of it being delivered it's 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 com- something that's quite foreign um, but also when it comes to like investors, you know, there's a lot more push these days with, especially with like um, climate change and all that for sustainable investment. So somehow if this could be weaved into part of that narrative, maybe it could sort of push for more ethical investment, if you like. So that if somebody was going to like uh, put a whole lot of seed funding into a new app, there's going to be offering like type services, they'd be like, wow. Well, we want to know how you treat the people who are actually doing the work. You know, um, right? Yeah, yeah. It has to be independently. It, you know, you know. Because mm. yeah, going back to the climate change thing, it's not that sustainable, is it? Everyone getting individual taxis. It's be much oh, no, better no, to get yeah. public transport, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. But my 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 point with that with climate change has been a lot more of a push from commercial entities and big big ones. Um, there's a quite a big pivot to what are you actually investing in and if the product you're investing in is going to exacerbate climate change we don't want that you know so it's somehow the, the rights of workers the rights of the economy workers could somehow be somehow weaved into that narrative then i think that could be useful from an investor viewpoint yeah do you think covid could change the narrative i mean what sam was saying about you know the lack of health and safety training lack of health and safety accountability you know mm-hmm. the, 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 the 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 thought that maybe an uber driver could give you covid might change the narrative a bit well it's not, um well i don't know I, 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 maybe the framing needs to be adjusted a little bit yeah. you know? <laughs> catch an uber get covid yay <laughs> um um, yeah, but at least from the health and safety perspective, whether it's going to be like, um, Anita mentioned a little bit about a lot of workers, you know, about 50% of them are working uh, part of, uh, part-time doing Uber. It's certainly from the fatigue perspective, you know, that, that needs to be taken into consideration. If you've done eight hours a day in the office, and then you're going to drive for however many hours after that, then that's, you know, this sort of goes against what those legal requirements are. Um, and there's, there's no checks and balances because it's pretty much self-regulated in terms of you uh, reporting the hours that you've done, recording it in a logbook or a or a app version of that logbook. Um, yeah, so 
So from the health and safety perspective, in terms of uh, fatigue management, that's possibly quite a big thing uh, for both, uh, maybe more for part-timers than full-timers. Yeah. Mm. Anita, do you want to just talk a little bit about your discussions with government? Because are you part of a kind of contractors working group? And is that coming to conclusion at some points? Yeah, so the government um, started consultation on um, a piece of work called Better Protections for Contractors. Um, it was, I think when it first started, it was a couple of years ago now, and um, they did a round of, of public consultation on that, which we were involved in. And then out of that, they um, set up a tripartite working group. So a tripartite working group is a, is a group that has um, representatives from the government. Um, and in this case, it's, it's the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Um, representatives from business and representatives from unions. So the Council of Trade Unions um, has representatives in that group. Um, it's not me personally, um, but we have a couple of really fantastic representatives from the CTU who are part of that group. And they've been working really hard over the last year or so um, to basically kind of go through all of this information that has come to them about the misclassification of workers as contractors in New Zealand and what that what that means for those workers, um, and you know it's a it's a really really big and important piece of work. Um, out of the process, they are putting together a, a report for um, you know for the minister uh, for workplace relations, Michael Wood. And the report will sort of summarise what the problem looks like um, in New Zealand and will also make recommendations around how to resolve the problem. So we're hoping that what will result um, is, you know, a mix of uh, legislative reform, um, strengthening the Employment Relations Act to make it really clear who um, a worker is and not allow employers to continue to misclassify workers. Um, and also to improve the uh, enforcement mechanisms that we have available to us, because it's all good and well having a strong law, but if you don't have any way to enforce it and um, the workers are being told that they don't have access to unions or that they can't have access to unions, then, you know, that that's there's still a problem there. So um, we're expecting to hear what um, those recommend recommendations are soon, um, and we're really hopeful that out of that we'll we'll see some sort of improvement. That sounds really positive. Yeah. Um, do you guys just want to all kind of finish off? Should we um, should we start wrapping it up about like what you what changes what real like what what do you think we should be demanding? from government to improve the lives of gig workers and this is going to help me because i'm writing a report up at the moment with some recommendations in it so i'd love to hear your thoughts that what what are, what should be our key demands just as summarizing well i'll, Sam, I'll let these two finish so i'll go first i think number one making sure works covered by the employment relations act um so that those minimum standards apply to people so that sick leave and you know i don't think a single person in new zealand thinks at the moment that a worker who's sick given covid shouldn't be able to stay home and shouldn't be financially forced to work so it's more crucial than ever and government you know for all of the steps we're putting in around managing covid that needs to be one fundamental one some worker protections to make sure that you have the ability to stay off with pay look after your sick kids when you're sick yourself and not take it to work to other people. The badge of honour is gone for that. Um, and so Employment Relations Act, Health and Safety Act and all the current existing regulations need to apply to all workers and all forms of work, regardless of those titles. Um, and then I would say a lot stronger provisions in, in the Employment Relations Act, you know, when Julian touched on hours of work, it's the amount of people these days working 60, 70 hours a week is just ridiculous and it impacts on our entire communities and the health and safety. People driving on those sorts of hours is going to end badly. Um, and so we need people to earn a wage that they can live on in 40 hours. Um, that's crucial. And there's no way to deny that one of the best forms of getting that is genuine, legitimate, 
um, you know, safe access to unions where you don't have to worry about losing your job or victimisation, where you know that you can go down that path and that when workers themselves, because that's who unions are, have the stronger rights and abilities to organise for some power and, and then they can start to make some real change. That's great. Um, Anita, do you want to go? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything um, that Sam said, funnily enough. Um, but yeah, I think the most important thing is that um, all workers are able to unionise and to collectively bargain. Um, it's really important that they also have those minimum standards that we refer to, like the minimum wage and sick leave and bereavement leave and annual leave and guaranteed hours and all that kind of thing. But um, if we if we were to sort of like choose between the two, it's, it's actually more important that they can unionise because unionised workers get all of that stuff and then some, you know. Most strong union sites, they're not on the minimum wage. They don't have those base levels of benefits anymore and haven't for a long time because they demand much more. Um, and that's, you know, that's the power in the collective and that's really important. Um, yeah, I just like to echo what Sam said around wages. Um, we harp on about wages all the time. I know that it's really, really important because low wages actually drive workers to, um, you know, act in unsafe ways. And when we're talking about workers who are driving for a living, driving is actually very dangerous. You know, we I know we do it all the time, so we just kind of don't really think about how dangerous it is. But more than 70% of workplace accidents are actually related to are related to vehicles. So that's not necessarily just on the road. It might be, um, you know, another kind of work vehicle. But that's a really staggering figure. And so when we're talking about workers who might be working a full-time job, doing something completely different, um, or doing something really similar, like bus drivers, for example, we know there are bus drivers out there who are working full-time as a bus driver doing split shifts and then going out there and driving an Uber because they just can't make ends meet. If you pay people wages that they can't live off, they have no choice but to, to go and find another source of income. And that's really dangerous when they're out there on the road doing that. So, um, you know, absolutely, we, we need to be looking at a safe rate system. Um, safe rate systems have been established um, in a number of countries around the world now. And the basic principle of that is that um, workers who um, that workers should receive a sustainable payment um, in exchange for their work that covers all of the costs of undertaking that work to remove this perverse incentive to engage in unsafe behaviour um, to try and get the work done, basically. Great, thanks, Anita. Julian, do you want to go? Is there a, what would you be your like top of your list of key demands you'd like to see? Um, for it to improve the lives of gig workers. We've, we've lost his audio. Um, okay, should we see, should we, should we, should we finish off there? Um, is, um, if there's no more comments or questions from the audience, um, just, oh, are you there, Julian? Um, are you there? Basically, both um, right, cool. what, what Sam and Anita say, but I'll just sum it up just by going a fair day's wage. No, we lost them again. Um, so just a, a comment from Bala Mohan. Um, about the, the barrier to unionizing. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, yeah. Do you want to go again? Sorry. I know he's gone again. Right, should we finish off there? Sorry, sorry, uh, Julian. We, we, your, you, your, um, your audio's gone again. And just, just finishing with Bala Mohan's point. Yeah, 
it is kind of we've got we need do we need to make unionism cool again to confront that culture of neoliberalism that individualizing culture that's anti-unionism i'm just gonna butt in yeah, right here and say that great. unionism um, so, is extremely yeah, sorry cool. um yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah i agree with anita yeah, what <laughs> it's cool already and for me unions, unions just are just really cool and sexy me. already um uh, uh, and I'll tell you what, I was on the picket line with our members at Countdown Distribution Centres last week. Um, and, like, they are the coolest people you will ever meet. Like, what is cooler than a bunch of workers in a warehouse just downing tools and being like, being like nah, screw this. Like, we're over it. We're just walking out. And then we're going to literally stand in front of a bunch of trucks and stop you from, from you know, stocking the supermarkets because you're, like, you know, taking the mickey out of us and bargaining like that's to me that's like that's really cool you don't get any know, right? that. and to me like what's uncool is like you know a corporate hack who doesn't care about people cares about money mm. it cares about profit and that's literally it you know doesn't care about actual people or people's lives or our communities totally yeah yeah i think things are changing i think the the narrative is changing especially in these kind of covid times when we've realized you can't just be an individual anymore you've got to be they've got to be think about others think about the collective hey and and, and yeah that's a good slogan julian a fair day's wa work wage for a fair day's fair, fair day's wage for a fair day's work right yeah we need to come out with some more like catchy slogans like that um okay yeah thanks everyone uh, give some thanks to the panelists that was a really great conversation guys and and hopefully it is just the start of a conversation that we really need to keep going and really kind of get it out in that public domain hopefully we can stop talking about just covid we can start talking about other things like like important things like this um in the next couple of years and really kind of change the narrative and build on that what what's happening overseas with lots of um, decisions going the way of the workers um the way of the gig workers that they really are workers they're not they're not contractors right um okay do, do, should we should we finish off there has anyone got any final comments or um should we say bye Thanks, guys. Thanks no very much. Appreciate.